introduction and thank you dr kanungo for the invitation for nucd 2022 i think dr ashok das has already spoken very uh, eloquently about the new drug and i have to talk about evergreen modern sulfonylurea so i had to div- uh, i had to find out what evergreen actually means and if you look at bollywood evergreen means anybody who is still in uh, i mean who can still play a leading role after the age of 50 60 so for when when in a hero can play a leading role for 50 60 years you consider him an evergreen hero and there are few people who have you know consistently played uh, leading roles for 50 60 years one of them is devanand and uh, amita bachchan also and um, most of you would have seen has been around now for 50 60 years so exactly 50 60 years is how long sulfonylureas have been around the first sulfonylurea was uh, marketed in 1956 and uh, it is now very much evergreen and uh, I'll, i'll i'll talk a little bit about the background because i'm sure everyone knows everything about sulfonylurea what i'm going to talk about is a little bit of history to show you why it is evergreen let's uh, my another favorite evergreen uh, set of heroes are from the james bond movie and the first james bond movie was also launched approximately the same time when we had our first sulfonylurea launched in around 1958 that was uh, uh, sean connery as uh, dr no so that was the first james bond movie and we know recently daniel craig has had the last james bond movie last year 2021 and he has said that he's not going to uh, be james bond anymore and we are on a lookout for a new james bond so james bond movies have been around for 60 years sulfonylureas have been around for 60 years just to say that long before there were drugs for diabetes sulfonylureas were worked on as herbicides and subsequently as antibiotics and it's exact it's a french physician who was actually looking for drugs to work against enteric fever who first discovered that the drugs he was using as antibiotics the sulfonylurea drugs were actually uh, killing the animals on which he was working on and then he found out that the cause of death and most of them was hypoglycemia and subsequently uh, the in this was around 1942 he uh, he contacted a colleague of his in the same university they were working august labotre who was actually the person who started working on sulfonylureas among his patients with what was then known as mild diabetes or which is now we know is type 2 diabetes so i think from 1942 we first knew about sulfonylurea but it took a long time for it to come into the market which is easy to understand because 1942 within a year uh frans where uh, these drugs were being researched on came under world war 2 and for almost 3 years uh, french were occupied by the germans and most of that research work went into german hands and unfortunately in 19 uh, in 1945 when germany lost the world war most of that information went to east germany where that information was subsequently almost lost but the some of this research was smuggled back into west germany and in 1956 we had the first two sulfonylureas marketed in germany and subsequently to europe and then we had sulfonylureas uh, uh, the lily was at that time the biggest diabetes company because it was making the maximum amount of insulins for the world so both these lily and upjohn these were two american giants they were in a race to find the best sulfonylurea and lily bet on what was called carbutamide and upjohn best uh, bet on a drug called tolbutamide and unfortunately carbutamide was found to have a lot of toxicity and it was withdrawn and the first actual long term sulfonylurea that came to be marketed all around the world was tolbutamide and the drug uh, the uh, trade name of the drug was actually uh, we'll show it later but i think what is again interesting is this is the same uh, uh, time or the same pathway that metformin took as well metformin was also a drug which was discovered in france went around europe for many years before it was picked up by america so both sulfonylurea and metformin two of the most widely prescribed drugs were discovered by french physicians and subsequently went to europe came to india and later came to america so it took a longer time for these drugs Uh, to reach uh, north america so with this 
just to tell you that uh, the first sulfonylurea was called Ornase, Orinase, uh, which was tolbutamide by Upjohn Pharmacy. And the if I uh, I just googled Orinase whether it is still available, and very surprisingly, Orinase is a brand of Glimipride in Pakistan. So they are still using the old uh, 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 trade name for uh, tolbutamide. With this in mind, I think uh, you should also remember that the first ban for a drug for diabetes, the first OAD was not rosiglitazone or was not troglitazone. The first FDA ban for an OAD was also for uh, uh, sulfonylurea, which was again tolbutamide. 1956, it was available, and by 1970, it had been banned. And again, this ban is also very similar to what happened with rosiglitazone. This was from a badly conducted study called the UDGP study, which is, uh, sorry, UGDP study, which is the University Group for Diabetes Program, where they suggested tolbutamide had an increased risk of cardiovascular events. And even before the FDA could ban the uh, tolbutamide, there was a lot of uh, uh, newspaper reports and many patients stopped taking and there was a lot of pressure on physicians to stop prescribing this. And so that was the first time we had a ban. And then subsequently for almost from 1970, before the second generation of sulfonylurea came about, there was only one sulfonylurea which was available, which was chlorpropamide. And then in 1980s, we had all these second generation sulfonylurea, which came about, a lot of them came about, but three of them are still with us, which includes glibenclamide, glipizide, and glyclazide. And then in 1995, we had uh, the third generation or the last sulfonylurea, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, approved, which was glimipride. So I think uh, the whole 60 years, have we've not uh, sat on the same sulfonylurea. We've had consequent improvements in sulfonylurea. And what we have is the what we call the end product of all these 60 years of development of sulfonylurea. But I think people were still worried about sulfonylurea even in 2012 in this uh, editorial about CV safety, despite the fact many people had uh, very clearly said that UGDP was a poorly conducted uh, a randomized control trial. Even 51 years later, people were using that to say that sulfonylureas are not cardiovascular safe. And I think uh, this is despite the fact at that time, UK PDS and Advance had already given good indications that uh, there is uh, no concern about CV safety. These were not uh, primarily triggered for CV safety for sulfonylurea, but both uh, the UK PDS and Advance had suggested that there was no increased risk of cardiovascular disease, even when the older generation in UK PDS, it was glibenclamide, which was used. And in advance, it was glyclazide, which was used. But finally, I think uh, sulfonylureas had their day in the sun when we had two large randomized control trials, uh, the Tosca IT in 2017, which actually compared head to head sulfonylurea. I mean, it was not just glimipride, glyclazide, glimipride versus pyoglitazone, which by that time had already been demonstrated as a, uh, as a good drug in terms of cardiovascular safety. In fact, it was had already demonstrated cardiovascular benefits uh, in terms of decrease in strokes and decrease in myocardial infarction. So TASCA, IT, and finally, I think in 2019, two years back, we've had the Carolina trial where it was directly compared to Lena Glipton. So I think cardiovascular safety is now very clearly established. We do not have to worry about this. Even after 60 years with the third generation uh, sulfonylurea, we have very reassuring cardiovascular safety. Unlike what Dr. Das was talking about, dapagliflozin protecting you, they do not cause any damage to the heart or cause any increased risk of heart failure or cause any problems uh, with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So with that clearly behind us, uh, I'll just uh, uh, once highlight what the uh, Carolina surprise was. We know that this was uh, uh, not a placebo control trial, a direct head to head comparison of about 6,000 patients who were about 3,000 of them were on 5 milligrams of lenagliptin, the other 3,000 on a titrated 1 to 4 milligram dose of glimipride. And the primary outcome was a standard 3 point mace. And you can see uh, both of them had similar outcomes showing that none of them was better or worse than the other. Both of them were equally good or cardiovascular safe. 
so with that in mind i'm sure dr das also showed you this uh, this picture and he told you that apaglifosin is going to help you with blood pressure management it's probably going to give you some additional cardiovascular kidney benefit and also help help with glycemic control with sulfonylurea unfortunately i'm not going to look at the other three pillars but i'm going to tell you one thing that the one single pillar it helps at that is glycemic management it is probably the most potent oral anti diabetic drugs in terms of glycemic management it does not help you with blood pressure control does not help you with lipid management we have to use a statin we have to use an arb we have to use drugs to protect the kidney and the heart but at least for glucose control it is the most potent glucose control in terms of an oral anti diabetic agents and regardless of all the agents that have come afterwards including dpp4 and sglt2 none of them can match the hpa1c lowering capacity of uh, sulfonylurea which was uh, and here it is glimepride a one alt i mean one exception to that may be oral glp1 analogs which we are currently uh, going to see in the uh, and probably going to come around this year but from the currently available armamentarium that we have of oral agents we do not have a drug which is uh, as potent as glimepride with this in mind i think this has to you have to remember that this is more both in case when it is used as monotherapy here we have uh, the bars with monotherapy and then also when it is used in combination with metformin as a combination therapy in both these are the most potent uh, drugs in its class i think uh, this is just a meta analysis just showing the same thing that i showed in bar graph that uh, the sulfonylureas are the most potent oral anti diabetic agents in trying to bring down hba1c so it only helps at one pillar but it is a very very strong pillar when you use sulfonylureas for glucose control now evergreen hero has been around for 60 years no new uh, uh, movies coming out but the main arguments against this are it should not be used for younger patients because we can use better agents for younger patients it should not be used for long standing type 2 diabetes because once you have long standing type 2 diabetes you have less beta cell function and you are less likely to improve uh, with sulfonylurea and obviously for cardiovascular disease and i'm sure i've reassured you about cardiovascular disease that controversy is over i'm just going to show you a few data about Uh, the use of this drug in newly diagnosed or what we call young diabetes this is a a paper a recent paper from dr yagnik and group which is looking at patients with young onset type 2 diabetes in india and what he suggests is the primary driver for glucose or hyperglycemia in these patients is insulin deficiency and he has uh, in this particular paper young uh, diabetes or young indians has been defined as patients with type 2 diabetes diagnosed before the age of 45 and the results are very clear that it is lack of insulin secretion that is responsible for the hyperglycemia so it is very easy to understand why sulfonylureas will be the drug of choice for patients who have poor glucose uh, uh, poor insulin secretion because these are drugs which are actual secretor gogs which are going to improve insulin secretion the other extreme is patients with long standing type 2 diabetes and here again i think i wanted to show you a paper this is about a 8 year old paper where they have added glimepride to patients with long standing diabetes these are patients with at least 10 years of diabetes they have added insulin Uh, added glimepride to an insulin metformin combination in type 2 diabetes with more than 10 years duration in a placebo controlled manner and what they can see is even in patients with diabetes which is more than 10 years who are on insulin who are on metformin adding glimepride gives you benefits in terms of hba1c compared to placebo so this is just to highlight again that even long standing diabetics may not get the same degree of uh, hba1c reduction but you still do get a uh, lowering effect of these evergreen uh, modern sulfonylureas and in terms of insulin sparing this is a small paper in drcp which suggested that glimepride is probably the most potent in terms among the current uh, sulfonylureas that we have in terms of uh, sparing effect of insulin of the sulfonylureas itself so i think uh, i'm i'm ticking all the boxes now in terms of uh, it can be used in newly diagnosed younger patients it can be used in longer type 2 diabetes it definitely 
has no concerns with excess mortality or morbidity with cardiovascular disease so with all of these things i think uh, we do have uh, the daniel pig which is uh, the latest modern sulfonylurea which is glimepride and i'm sure uh, for its evergreen and will continue to have uh, a, a leading role in the management of oral uh, of type 2 diabetes with oral agents in the years to come 60 years it has already played a leading role and i'm sure dr ashok said that dapagliflozin will be the number 3 prescribed drug but i think metformin and sulfonylurea will continue to occupy a number 1 and 2 spots in terms of oral agents for some more years to come 60 years and counting and uh, i think uh, out of the sulfonylureas glimepride is the one which is going to play this leading role and i've shown you that in terms of efficacy at this point among the agents that we have oral agents that we have there is nothing that matches glimepride and in terms of uh, it's used in all kinds of patients whether it is younger patients older patients long standing diabetes cardiovascular disease i don't think uh, there is any combination and i think uh, what we have to realize is there is now more than enough data about cardiovascular safety and uh, i think those issues are now not to uh, should not be brought up again so with this uh, i thank you for the opportunity to speak about evergreen sulfonylureas and uh, i think i'll stop there in here thank you very much thank you